Okay, another thing that I wanted to mention is that if you noticed over several Sundays, today's not too bad, but we've got 20 people not here today. But seating is getting harder and harder to find, so we're going to try to reinstitute uh, some sort of an ushering system. So, gentlemen, any of you guys that would like to take part in that to help out on Sunday mornings, uh, we'll talk about that in a few weeks, but uh, you can contact me. Uh, I'm going to be gone for the next two Sundays anyway, but after that we'll get, uh, or maybe three, maybe three, depending on how fast I drive. If we have a southern wind blowing back or if we get tired of that Florida heat and humidity, uh, we'll be back. So keep that in mind because so some mornings it's, uh, we're, we're not out of seats, but they're hard to see when you come in in the back. And if we have some guys that would be willing to kind of walk around and say we got three or four up here, let us know. The other thing that since, since I've gotten married a year ago, it's been a lot of sorting out stuff, cleaning out things, a lot to do with my wardrobe. <laughs> this is for you, Nick. No. <laughs> but there's things that I probably shouldn't keep anymore. I've had them for like 40 years, and I probably don't need... Th those fashions are not coming back into style, I've been told. And so, out. But I found this the other day. Nice, cute little t-shirt. First Baptist Church that we had. It says 1849 to 1999. On the back, it's got this. First Baptist Church of Darlington on the right track for 150 years. Now, I say that in way of communicating that it's been 25 years. I've had this shirt for 25 years. <laughs> I'm going to keep it. But this is our 175th anniversary this December. And so keep, keep in mind, we're going to, uh, we're going to be uh, trying to put something together to I mean, I didn't even think of it. And I'm like the almost, almost the oldest person in here. So, almost, I said. Uh, but there's some church history here. It was in December 19th of 1849 when a group of people met right up here in a wagon uh, shop and talked about organizing a Baptist church. And from those humble beginnings, we have persevered, we have been faithful to teaching God's word, and 175 years, we're just getting started, and we'll continue until Jesus comes back. So, The scripture today, this is John chapter 2, last week I... Two weeks ago, I spoke about John chapter 1. Yes. Children's church. Children's church. <laughs> My wife told me, don't forget the children's church. If you are a child, a children, children that goes to children's church, you may rise and you may head that direction. Oh, I am so sorry. I'm sorry. I, you just told me. Maybe I am the oldest person in here. Oh, man. Okay. John, chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 11 verses today. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, his mother said, mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. 
Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who drew, had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we come this morning uh, just to look into this passage, uh, the first miracle that you performed taking place at a wedding, I would just pray that you would lead us and teach us uh, the truths that you have from this passage. Uh, sometimes we become too familiar with stories of the Bible and, and we overlook things or don't, don't glean out some of the the deeper things in there, and I would just pray that if there's things here, that you would open our hearts to that. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, who's planned a wedding lately? Anybody working on that, planning a, a wedding, uh, say, within the last couple of years? You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of details to take care of, to get worked out. From today's lesson in John chapter 2, first 11 verses, takes place at a wedding reception. And at that wedding reception, we see Jesus interacting in a normal setting, but in an abnormal way. Our lesson picks up in John's second chapter with a story familiar to most of us, uh, Jesus' first miracle. And it starts out by saying that on the third day, uh, we might ask, you know, what's that third day from? Well, two weeks ago we talked about Jesus calling some of his disciples and, and meeting with Nathaniel and, and Nathaniel and Jesus having a conversation, Nathaniel declaring, Jesus, you are the Son of God. And then they, they move on. Uh, it says that uh, that all took place near Bethany where John was baptizing. Now it's three days later in those days, back then, they had a thing for the, the young men, the young boys, called the Bar Mitzvah. And we've heard of that, the Bar Mitzvah. It was a celebration into manhood, into adulthood, where he's no longer recognized as a young boy. He's now has the rights, responsibilities of a man. Age 13, that took place. How old are you guys? 13? Ready to get married? <laughs> Mom says, good. <laughs> Boys, age 13. Girls, age 12. They could be married legally. Another thing we learn is marriages in the Bible are most often prearranged by the fathers. The, the marriage had very little to do with a young man and a young woman meeting and, and finding out they had things in common and some things not in common. We can work on those and, and had very little to do with that. It was basically arranged by the parents because there was some mutual benefit to both. Uh, some passages talk about uh, a king marrying the daughter of a king from another nation, another country, because now the two nations would be intertwined, and you're not going to come to war against me because I'm your son-in-law, or you're my father-in-law. Uh, back then, they didn't send out invitations, per se, and, and RSVP cards, and all that kind of stuff, but you knew it was going to happen, and you just waited. And once the groom had made all the preparations to receive his bride, he would go and get her and actually bring her back. But he would announce his coming by blowing a trumpet and making shouts so everybody knew the groom is on his way, the bride is ready, and they go back, and then they have the actual 
wedding take place and the banquet that we are reading about to now. Today we have the re- wedding reception followed by, or the wedding ceremony followed by a reception it involves a meal for that day for those guests. But back then, this banquet could last at least a week. And so you would have to know how many people were coming and how much food and how much drink and, because you wanted, did not want to run out. So now as we look back at our text today, we read that Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with Jesus and his disciples, were all invited and they were there in attendance. The Bible says that the newly couple, newly wedded couple, had run out of wine. This could possibly have brought uh, great humi- uh, hurt to that family, uh, great shame upon the family, the groom and his bride. You know, how could you have planned for a wedding and not had enough to eat, not had enough to drink? They would always be remembered as the family who could not provide. And so Mary tells Jesus, Jesus, they're out of wine, in which Jesus responds, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Now, we might think that was a harsh way of speaking to Mary, dear woman, but Jesus said it out of love, and it was a, a good response at that time. It, he was not putting her down in any way. But he was saying that his time had not yet come. There would come a time when Jesus would reveal who he was and why he had come. It wasn't yet. But even so, Jesus had compassion on this family. And therefore, out of the compassion that Jesus had, he went about doing something. We see his compassion in the other Gospels and how he meets people's needs and so he was going to meet this need Jesus even though it's not time he directs the servants to take those six stone water jars that were standing there and to fill them with water now it said they were between 20 and 30 gallons you take an average of that you're looking at 150 plus or minus 150 to 180 gallons of water that they pour into those jars. And as soon as they were full, Jesus says, take some of that water now and take it to the the master of ceremonies, the the banquet, uh, the person in charge, the one overseeing it. And we all know how the story goes. The master tastes that wine. He says, that is the best wine that has been served all day. Everyone always serves the the good stuff. And when people have had a little bit of fill of the good stuff, then they bring out the inferior stuff. This is the best ever. So my question is, just another little thing. How many have made wine in here? I haven't. I, I have no idea how to make wine other than you start with grapes. And maybe there's wine made from other things too, but I think generally of grapes. So I had to look it up. How, how long does it take to make wine? And in an article that I read, you know, if, if some of you have done it and done it different, okay. But this is what I read, that, it, that a minimum amount of time from the time you pick the grapes and squeeze them and, and do everything, it should take about two months from start to finish to where you would have a product ready, ready to taste. And if you want to age it, it could take much longer, a year or more. How long did it take Jesus? How long did it take him to make this wine? That might have been too long. Just instantly. Jesus told the servants to fill the jars, and then once they were full, dip some out and take it to the, take it to the master of ceremonies. Jesus, who spoke all of creation into existence, just at the sound of his voice, has done something in just seconds that should take a year, maybe more. See, Jesus is beyond all time. Jesus, to Jesus, a second 
is as a thousand years. At, at his very direction, time can stand still, or he can accomplish something that takes a long time in just an instant. So here at the first miracle that Jesus performs, we see Jesus using something from ordinary events to point to a greater message yet to come. A little earlier I said we would get back to some of the events of the wedding and surrounding it. There are three elements, three elements to the Jewish wedding that are good points of comparison for what Jesus has done, what Jesus is doing, and what Jesus will do. First, the father would have to pay a, a price for the bride. God the Father paid a very great price for the bride of Christ. The price of the blood of his very son, Jesus, given on the cross and shed that all who believe in him would have everlasting life. See, Jesus told his mother at that time, my time has not come when he was at that wedding. But yet his time would come. And the Bible says that Jesus was continually telling his disciples and those that he healed that his time had not come. But there would come a day when Jesus said that the time has come. And at that time, Jesus went to the cross to shed his blood so the sins could be forgiven. God the Father gave his only begotten son to die on a cross to pay for the sins of people, to pay for my sins, to pay for your sins. Fifty shekels doesn't come close. No greater bride price has ever been paid than what Christ paid. Second, the groom would go back to the father's residence to prepare a place for his bride. Jesus following the his death and resurrection, we are told in John chapter 14, has gone to heaven where he is preparing a place for us. Just as the groom in Israel would go back home and make a place for his bride, Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. In this analogy that Jesus used, the church is the bride of Christ being made ready for the groom. We, the church, Together are the bride of Christ that he died for, that he's now preparing a place for. As we put our faith in Christ, we become members of that universal church known as the bride of Christ. And it is for this, bri this price, this bride that Jesus is preparing a place that he may come and receive her unto himself. And the third thing that we read and we see in the wedding is that when the groom has finished all of his preparations, He's going to return. He will return to get his pride and to take her to himself and take her where he will have a great banquet ready. The bride has no idea when this is going to take place. But she looked expectantly towards that day. When the groom is ready, he will announce with a trumpet and with a loud shout that he is coming back. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. We need to be making all the preparations we need to as the bride of Christ to be ready for that day he returns. We are told in the Bible that when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise, and then those, of, uh, those who are alive in him will be taken to heaven, and they will be joined with the Lord, and there will be a great celebration. Until Jesus comes... Until he returns, we are commanded to do just a couple of things. We're commanded to go and make disciples of all people. We are commanded to keep watch, to stay prepared, to tell others about that great price that Jesus paid. We're told to be ready. Not to get ready, but to be ready. We don't know when the bridegroom is coming back, when he will have finished his preparations that he is working on before he comes to collect his bride. But we do know, we do know that Jesus is coming back and he will retrieve his church. 
We know that we must be ready for that day. We also know that there are many out there who are not ready for that day. And so Jesus tells us to tell others to share his word. When he returns, may he find us busy telling others, showing them how to be ready, how to wait for his return. Now, there's great hope in that. We're not left on our own. We're not left with not knowing what's going to take place. We are told that Jesus will be coming back. He's coming back for us someday. And he's telling us to be ready for that day and to make sure others are ready also. Shall we pray? Jesus, I'm so thankful that you performed your first miracle. And it was at a, a, a wedding scene where we can see how you, you have paid a price for us, how you loved us so much that you gave your very life. And we see how you are preparing a place for us. And Lord, we know that you are coming back for us someday. Lord, I just pray that you would find us ready, that you would find us busy about doing your work of telling others that they too need to be ready. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.